So I didn't realize this was Friday the 13th <laughs> until I looked at the calendar today, but so far things have come up without too much of a hitch. Um, so today I'm going to try and um, talk about the fifth kingdom of life, uh, fungi, uh, which is probably the most diverse, um, the, um, the biggest, um, and maybe the most interesting and most important and best all over. <laughs> Uh, no, 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 <laughs> since things crawled out of the ocean uh, about that time. Anyway, so what I'm going to start doing, or what I'm going to do, the t uh, is initially start talking about fire in the Smokies, well, fire period, and what fire does. Um, and uh, then I want to talk about the, um, the specific role of fire fungi. These are fungi that appear uniquely after fires and how uh, they help the forest recover. Um, and so that's kind of the path that I'll take through this. So let's start with um, uh, uh, establishing that fire once was part of the normal cycle of things in the southern Appalachians. I should start by saying that there's a lot known about western fires. Uh, that's, that's fairly well documented, but there's very little data about the eastern deciduous forests, and part of the reason for that is that fires have been suppressed in eastern deciduous forests for about 100 years. Uh, so this is data by Henry Grissenmeyer in uh, Geography and Sally Horn. Um, and what we're looking at here is tree ring data. So each of the, uh, to, to establish tree ring data, Henry got permission to cut down a bunch of trees in the park. Um, and I'm not sure that would ever happen again, but that he was lucky. <laughs> And if you look at a tree that's been burned, many of the trees that have been burned form this cavity, a burn cavity. Um, and as the, yeah, as the tree heals, this is the burn cavity on a slab of wood, as the tree heals and continues to grow, new rings form and you can date the, the burns from the time um, that they occur by comparing the tree rings to the burn area. So this is the, the tree cavity there. And what uh, each of these lines going this way represent a single trunk and the hash marks on this represent burn scars on, on the cross section of the trunk. And by lining up a whole bunch of different tree uh, trunks and laying them out chronologically, uh, Henry was able to show that from about 1825 down uh, up to about 1934, when the park was established, fire, see all of these lines represent fire in, this is Pine Mountain, which is in the Smokies, over by Happy Valley, and then suddenly nothing. So fire's been suppressed, and because of that, few loads have built up on the forest floor. And those fuel loads have been coupled with hemlock mortality, uh, so we have a lot of standing dead trees, a lot of down branches, etc. So it was, um, a fire was suppressed and this was an opportunity that was going to happen sooner or later. Okay, and it did. So combination of drought that year, 2016, you may remember we had this incredible drought. Starting in about June, there was almost no water clear through December. I kept looking at my plants around my place. I was watering like crazy, trying to keep them alive. No water, and the park was dry, dry, dry. And we had arson, and then we had one of two big wind events in the park. This was the first and it took um, arson and, um, ex and made the fire explode and then it tossed embers um, from the core fire up over 
mountain peaks where the, there was a vortex and brought them down on other sides. So what we have in the Smokies now is a really patchy series of fires. Some that are high intensity, some that are medium intensity, some that are low intensity, right next door to no fire at all. Okay. Um, and those, those logs burned for a while. I was using one of those logs to mark a site, one of the down burned logs, and I kept wondering, why is that log disappearing? You know, I come back and it's gone, and it's gone, and it's gone. It was just smoldering. It was burning within. And that can occur, that can keep burning for months, quite literally. And soils could burn and smolder for months. So it took until winter, really, to knock this, the remnants of this fire out. Okay, so this was Baskins Creek Watershed. This is off the Roaring Fork Nature Trail uh, in February 2017, two months after the fire. And all of these trees are blackened. Uh, what you see on the ground are this mass of pine needles that fell from these trees. This area is an area of an endemic, the Table Mountain Pine, Pinus pungens, and it's an Appalachian endemic, and it's a fire-loving tree, and its <laughs> range has been getting smaller and smaller and smaller over the last hundred years because of no fire. But it was pretty badly burned. So what happens in a severe burn area, because a lot of what I'm wor working with is a severe burn area, the first thing that happens is the soil is actually physically changed. It feels different. If you pick it up, it crackles, it's coarse, it's not smooth. And if you look at your hands, they'll be gray afterwards, and that's the massive charcoal that has been dumped um, on this. Uh, and, and so all of that happens. All of the organic material has been burned off in a high burn area. So if you see, if you could take a look here, this was the organic layer, about that deep. It's duff, essentially. Uh, needles and organic material, about that deep. And up to this point here, it's just burned off, leaving bare ground. And over here um, is, the, uh, is what it used to be like. So patchy in places. Um, the other thing that happens in a fire is all the ground cover, the things that hold moisture on the ground, mosses and liverworts are burned off. They're gone. Um, and uh, carbon um, is deposited, nitrogen sulfates are burned off. <coughs> um, most microorganisms, bacteria and fungi in the top eight inches of soil are destroyed. Unless they're particularly fire resistant, they're gone. So all of a sudden the soil is really reduced in its biodiversity for a short period of time. Uh, and finally, the soil texture is changed so that water runs off really easily. It doesn't soak in. Um, and because of that, you get runoff into streams um, that that adds nutrients to the streams. You get more black fly and other noxious insects and some not so noxious. Um, but um, that's, that's a consequence of a burn. All right, but not all things about burns are bad. So from the western U.S., for example, this little black-backed woodpecker absolutely requires fire. It lives only at the edge of fire burns and it uses the, the grubs in burned trees uh, to feed its young. So it's absolutely dependent on fire to survive. All right, so what about the Smokies? The very first thing I noticed two months afterwards when we got uh, permits and got into the Smokies uh, to start collecting was that every downed, burned log had been worked over by woodpeckers. They had been in that, and I, I kept thinking, hmm, they just want some nice warm grubs, you know, they've been well cooked. Um, but it really, inside these logs, they're not, not completely burned, they're not charcoalized all the way through. And that's what the woodpeckers were after, and they just decimated all these big downed logs. So fire has some benefits. Um, 
some little bats. This is the brown, little brown bat. Isn't it cute? <laughs> and, and yeah, it is cute. Um, and they live in the bowls of, of burns where they're very big. And of course, this is the Table Mountain uh, Pine. It looks like a scruffy pine. It's not good for timber, but it's a good pine to occupy shallow, nutrient-poor soils. That's its specialty area. OK, and of course, fungi. Uh, so there's a unique guild. I finally get to it. There's a unique guild of fungi that appear only after fires. You never see them at any other time. So where do they come from? Well, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Where do they go when they disappear? We don't know. <laughs> what do they eat? How do they consume organic material? We don't know what their specialties are. Um, we know very little about them, generally speaking. Uh, but there are a group of uh, a spe specific guild known from the West, known from Spain, known from all around the world of fungi that appear uniquely after fires. They're adapted to coming up after fires. All right, so we were able to get some money from NSF by arguing. <coughs> Many of you know that the uh, Smokies, Great Smoky Mountains National Park, is a all tax on biodiversity area. Um, and we've been working on fungi in the park for since 1934, essentially. And we have been documenting species, and we now have about 5,000 fungal species from the park. So we were pretty sure, these are 5,000 unique names, we were pretty sure we knew what was there. But we didn't know about fire fungi. We have never had that opportunity. So NSF gave us, gave us a seed grant to collect these fire fungi <clears throat> and to add them to the all taxon biodiversity inventory. So that was the systematics group. So we put together a group. This is our team. The team is from Savannah State, um, a traditionally black college, University of Tennessee, Berkeley, University of Illinois, and people from the park. Um, and some of you may know that there's a field station just outside Greenbrier that is run by the bio, uh, biology department and available for anyone to use. There are two houses with good beds, showers, toilets, everything you could want, a full kitchen, washer, dryer, everything you could want. And the central area right here is, is a lab. Uh, so, um, if you're interested in using it, uh, contact the Department of Biology and uh, their webpage has a link to it. Okay, so what do fungi do? What roles do they play in forest recovery? Um, and uh, fungi, um, what role one that they play is that they are symbiotic with most plants. So uh, we have, um, there are two kinds of symbioses. Let me take this one first. This is a little pine tree, and these are the, actually the roots. I just follow that. That's it. Those are the roots. Everything out here is the fungus attached to the roots. And this is what is called an ecto, meaning outer, mycorrhiza fungus. And that, here is the sheath of fungal tissue on the outside of the root. So what the fungus does is it picks up phosphates, water, and nitrogen, um, and nitrates uh, from, it expands the root system. So it gives the tree an advantage in that it can get water and other things from uh, distance. And what does it give the fungus in return? It gives the fungus photosynthesis uh, photosynthate. It gives the fungus sugars from photosynthesis. So the fungus gets sugars, the plant gets the essential elements needed to make it grow. That's ectomycorrhizal. This is a single cell right here. Now uh, you can't see the outline of the cell, but what you can see in, inside the cell are all of these little tubes. And if you think of this as a balloon, and you stick your finger in the balloon, you're not really inside the balloon at all. But what you're doing is putting a projection in that balloon. And if you keep putting projections in that balloon, 
balloon. You start filling up that balloon with the surfaces that are going to exchange nutrients with the plant. And in turn, the plant will give that sugar. So endomycorrhiza are mostly grasses and monocots. These are mostly trees. Um, and 80% of our plants are mycorrhizal. 80% of all plants are mycorrhizal. All right, so this is a little pine tree here. This is with mycorrhiza, this is without. So it makes a difference competitively to the tree. It's really important and really critical. All right, and also in the Smokies, we of course have these, the ericaceous plants. And they, in some of the burn areas, these were so badly disturbed, so badly burned, that they may never come back. There was an eight inch soil duff la uh, layer that they were growing on, um, on bullhead, and that's burned to bare rock. And they don't know if they'll ever recover. But they also are mycorrhizal. They have a specific, different kind of mycorrhiza. It's endo, it's inside the cell. They're called ericoid mycorrhiza. So um, uh, zayas, rhododendron, mountain laurel, blueberry, all of these are ericoid mycorrhizal. So they need those fungi too. All right, the other thing that fungi do is those that are not mycorrhizal or symbiotic with plants will break down dead materials and return them to the environment. And they do so by excreting digestive enzymes out of their cell walls into the surrounding wood and the wood is digested and then they take up glucose or sugars from, from that area. It's kind of like taking your stomach and turning it inside out um, you know, if you think about it that way, fungi digest outside their bodies. So if our stomach was outside and we were pumping stuff into the environment, that's what a fungus does. It's kind of gross. Okay, so I took this picture just last week. This is a well-burned trunk. It doesn't look it, but it is. And this is a saprobe. It breaks down wood. All of this wood, all of this burned material has to be returned to the environment before plants can pick it up and use it again. It has to be digested, the nutrients released into forms that the plants can get them. And that's the job of fungi and bacteria in the soil or in any environment. Okay, so what happens is uh, fungi break down uh, this uh, wood. All wood is is compressed carbon, compressed CO2 from the air, all right? So CO2 from the air is compressed into wood and when wood breaks down, CO2 is released. So fires convert forests from net sinks for carbon to net sources for carbon for a period of 100 years or so, long time. All right, and then there's one more group of fun fungi that we know almost nothing about, and these are endophytes. Endo meaning within, phyte referring to plants. And these were discovered a few years ago, uh, much to everybody's surprise. The little blue lines are fungal threads all through here, and this is a cross section through a leaf or a stem. And you can see the fungi growing through the plant. And you would think fungi or saprobes are going to damage the plant. No, they don't. These endophytes don't harm the plant. In a few cases, we know that they do some good. They provide some bad tasting or toxic compounds uh, that prevent the plant from being graced. But in most cases, we have no idea what they do. They're just there. Okay, so these are cultures of endophytes. Uh, just to show you that if you sterilize these and put them on medium, you can grow these endophytes out. All right, so this was our protocol. We divided <coughs> everything into, we, we selected um, about uh, 13 sites and then discarded some of them, leaving nine. 
So we have intense burn, moderate burn, light burn, and no burn sites. <coughs> And then from this, we made above ground collections of fungi soil cores, which we froze at minus 80 to look at next gener <laughs> use um, next generation sequencing um, to try and figure out exactly what's in the soil over time. And these are taken every two weeks. Uh, we did some leaf needle culturing to look for endophytes. And at a point, I'll show you this, about halfway through last year's study, we started digging up pine trees um, and taking their roots off. Um, and it was tricky getting permission for that, but, but there are lots and lots of pine trees. There really are. And as long as we took less than a certain percentage, we, and they were far apart, we were allowed to dig them up. From all of these, we take a DNA samples and we amplify or get what is called the fungal barcode. This is a single genetic sequence that uniquely characterizes a species of fungus. Um, what is it? It is the ribosomal RNA uh, spacer region, ITS1, 5.8, ITS2. Um, and uh, the original barcode effort tried to use uh, a mitochondrial gene, COX-1, uh, and it doesn't work for fungi. It has too many transposable elements in it. Uh, and fungi were all, the fungal groups were already heavily invested in the, this area of the ribosomal RNA gene um, because of some previous work by Tom Bruns at Berkeley. So even, <coughs> even the light burn would destroy it? Um, a light burn will destroy, everything goes yes, away. everything goes away, but to varied degrees. Okay, um, my, not all mycorrhizal are destroyed in a, a light burn area, but in a heavy burn area, you get a lot more destruction. Okay, uh, so fungi that initially appear in a high, in these are some results. The first is that burn intensity matters. That goes to the question I just got. Uh, burn intensity ma uh, matters. So this is uh, the Baskins Creek watershed. And fungi that are, uh, first appear in the high burn areas are these fire fungi, fungi that we have not seen before. And they appear sequentially in time. So if I was not out there every two weeks, they were gone. I missed something. So it was really critical to be out there every two weeks collecting and make sure uh, that, that we got what, uh, what we could get. And the other um, um, burn intensity matters point is that in areas that are not so intensely burned, this area is off the Cove Hardwood Trail at the Chimneys Picnic area. And that was a relatively light surface burn. It never got into the crown. It just sort of raced along the ground. It really was not bad, uh, given where it was. And you can see that the area, this is after the burn, and you can see that the area is recovered fairly well. Is the, is the difference, uh, is the DNA in the, in the new stuff, the new fungi? Uh-huh caused by the fire and the alteration of the DNA chain? No, the fire doesn't cause mutations. It we just it use, it no, it destroys the organism, but we can recover from the soil that sequence and we can tell what's left after time. <coughs> okay, so let's look at some of these uniquely fire fungi. And I, I'm going to go over these one at a time. Pyronema, Anthrocobia. Now, to give you, you have no scale here, so you don't know how big these are. These are about the size of a head of a pin. Okay, but they in the West, this one covers the ground so much the ground turns pink. Here, we found it only in little tiny patches. Here, however, we found masses of Anthrocobia. Anywhere there was a burn hole where a tree had burned a hole, you know, the trunk had burned out and left a hole, anywhere there was a, an intense burn hole, we got anthrocobia and it covered the ground. It made the ground look orange. It was really amazing. Uh -huh. 
Uh, this is my favorite, Geopixis. Um, and I'll go back to these. This Foliota we'll talk about, and this and this. So we're going to talk about each of those individually. So when I talk about these, I'm going to try and give you a hint about where we think they are during non-fire periods. Where are they hiding? Are they in the soil or are they somewhere else? And the other thing about these is when we get a sequence, an ITS sequence, a barcode sequence from Pyronema, and we look, we match it in the national, European, and North American databases for fungal sequences, we find that the sequence doesn't change across continents. This is a cosmopolitan fungus. That's unusual because many, many, many of the fungi that we have been picking up above ground uh, for the last, since 1934, are endemic to the Smokies. They're <coughs> unique to the Smokies, but not these. These are, seem to be worldwide. I can't explain that. What causes the replication of the DNA? What causes it? Um, it, it DNA won't replicate unless it's in the organism. Uh, and then the, the gene that we're looking at is one of the enzymes necessary to cause the uh, DNA to replicate. But I'm not sure that that's what you're looking for. What you're look, what you might be asking something about cosmopolitan? No, I was just looking at the first and second bullet. Oh, okay. All right, so uh, if we take, um, these are not our studies, but these are studies by Tom Bruns at Berkeley. And what he does is he goes in after an intense fire and extracts the DNA from soil and, and then asks what proportion of those DNAs are pyronema and what proportion of those DNAs are something else. So what he does is he breaks the fungus apart extracts the DNA, and then asks what it is proportionally. Does, does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. OK. Uh, so the, these, are, they're, these probably exist at really low levels in, in unburned soil, but studies have shown they're not very competitive, that, that other fungi can really outcompete them for food and everything else. Mm -hmm. But they're there. <clears throat> and furthermore, their spores are highly fire resistant. So after a fire, these things explode. But where are they when they're not in the fire and not in soil? They are endophytes of these two lichens. They exist inside the lichens. So they're propagated as part of the lichen life cycle. And then when there's a fire, lichens burn up. Uh, these fungi release their spores, the spores germinate, and we get this little guy, Pyronema domestica. So that's our first clue, where are these things coming from? This is Anthrocobia. Um, this uh, is the orange one that covers, here are pine needles. This gives you the size of the Anthrocobias in pine needles. Um, we know that there are at least three distinct taxa in the Smokies. Um, and at least two of these are new to science, maybe all three new to science. These are not the anthrocobias that other people are seeing. Where, where does it come from? It's a normal endophyte of mosses and lichens. Okay, so we're starting to see a pattern. Geopixis, my favorite, it's called <coughs> the charcoal-loving pixie cup. <laughs> which, which I just adore. For some reason I find that just too cute. Um, and these are always, size. huh? Size, scale. Uh, these are hemlock needles. Okay. Okay. This is the lichen. <laughs> they are they're found on burned hemlock duff under hemlock trees, but they're not found unless that tree has been scorched. Okay. So if the tree's been scorched, these will come up. This is a mycorrhizal fungus. It's a known mycorrhizal spruce. It could be mycorrhiza with hemlock also. We don't know that. We haven't found this as an endophyte. This was Foliota highlandensis. This was our most persistent little fungus. It started right after the fire. We started seeing it. 
It lasted all through the winter. I picked up frozen fruit bodies in December uh, and lasted until spring. Mm -hmm. And now I'm not seeing it. Now that spring is finally here, it's finally declined, but it lasted a whole year. It is found in all of our burn areas, every single one of them, light to heavy. There's no discrimination there. It's an end the fight of liverworts. That's where we find it. Um, it. Its DNA is identical around the world, but its morphology, the way it looks, is not the same. And Morchilla. So how many of you know about morels? <laughs> A few of you. Okay, so you know these are delicious, right? And they're up right now. All right, so those of you that are morel hunters know the, the, um, the story that morels fruit after a fire. So all the, uh, all the amateurs are out there last year and this year looking for morels. And they came up. Uh, in the intense fire zone, just in a two-week block, and then they were gone, just very, very quickly. Um, and we were able to get um, some cultures from them and to genotype them, so we know that they are Morchella exuberans. That's the species name. We didn't know what species it was uh, in the eastern uh, fire zones. We had no clue because everybody that collected them ate them. And nobody saved a herbarium specimen. So, you know, so we had nothing to document what they were. So now we knew. Um, and the reason they come up in fire zones is because they will store hard little knots of fungal tissue, sclerotia right here, in the ground for a hundred years. And when there's a fire, this forms the morel. So they come up from sclerotia. Okay, these uh, were not particularly edible because they were so covered with charcoal that, that they were gritty and we didn't even try. Um, okay, this one is Spirosporella hinula and it's tiny, tiny, again, no bigger than the head of a pin. Um, and it turns out to be a major player, this, this little tiny thing is a major player in a fungal recovery, fungal mediator recovery of forest. It's mycorrhizal, it's the first thing we see on roots of developing pines, very early. Uh, it's a fire fungus, we found it on the surface in all the fire zones, and then we found it on the roots of little tree seedlings that were developing in the Table Mountain Pine area. So we know where that mycorrhiza <laughs> comes from collected in all high burn zone areas. Okay, we all, those are the fire limited fungi. We only see them after fires. But there were a couple of surprises and these are fire enhanced fungi. These are fungi that normally are present in the Smokies but a fire causes them to explode, to bloom, so to speak. This is uh, Mycena galericulata, and we must have found 100 collections right after the fire. This year, nada. It's a very rare fungus in the park, but it is existed. It exists in the park. We have it in our database. Dean Hessler collected it. Ron Peterson collected it. You know, all, all our mycologists collected it. Uh, and, and it just exploded. It survived because it has the ability to come from very deeply buried materials. So sometimes I'd pull up a stem of this and that stem would be that long. You know, it's way, way down there. So the, that was actually documented historically? <clears throat> yes. Okay. Yeah, by going into our uh, herbarium database, we could document that. And then this lovely thing, Hygrosity conica. So midsummer we went out into the burn areas and all of this blackened area had red and yellow everywhere popping up through this burned ground. Um, and this is, this, you see the little burn pieces on it. Um, this is um, probably a species complex. It's something we're gonna have to work with. Its mode of nutrition is unknown. It's not mycorrhizal. It's not a sap rope, but it gets its carbon, it gets its sugar from a plant somehow, and we don't know how. 
so this is going to take a lot more work because it probably is a complex. All right, so this is sort of a summary. Uh, it's not quite up to date, and I don't expect you to read it, but we have 46 new fire species to add to the ATBI. We have five new to science, for sure, and 19 probably new to science, each of which is going to take some work. Okay, mycorrhiza. So I'm going to skip over now to mid-season. We started seeing all these little pine trees in the Table Mountain Pine area. So when the Table Mountain Pine burns, the cones are serotonous. They open and they drop their seeds. Um, that's what makes them fire trees. Uh, and midway through the season, they started germinating. So we talked to the park and, as I said, got permission to take a tree here and there and here and there. Um, and again, some of those trees don't look so good, but others look very good. Um, and we took them, washed their roots, and then started looking at the roots to see if they were mycorrhizal. And trees that were even no bigger than that were mycorrhizal already. You know, so they grab whatever fungus remains in the soil at that point. They grab it and they latch onto it. All right, so our, our concept was the different areas, the different high burn areas probably had different surviving fungi just as a function of where they were. Uh, so in the different areas, we should see different fungi mycorrhizal on the roots. And we selected Bassins Creek over here, Cove Mountain, and two, uh, two Mile Trace and Cove Mountain as our three high burn sites. And sure enough, that's true. The the mycorrhiza on each of those three areas was different. Um, so reflecting differences in what's available in the soil initially. But then we said the thought, all right, but fungi produce spores. Here's a little puffball producing spores. There's a link to it. And here's a uh, basidia by seed, a mushroom. And this is the spore mass. It's <coughs> dropping and being wafted away by the wind. And we figured that, that spores are going to invade the burn areas from outside the burn area. And so as the season progresses, we're going to see different fungi on the roots and maybe more fungi on the roots. Maybe two fungi on the roots in different places or three or four. The maximum we have found is four. And that turns out to be true also. Uh, and so here are the major players in the burn area. Spherosporella, you remember I told you about that one as one of the first <coughs> burn fungi, uniquely burn fungi, also uniquely mycorrhizal. Uh, Lacaria, Trichodermorpha, um, it came up mid-season in adjacent areas and within a few weeks we saw it on roots. So it was fairly quick transition between seeing the mushroom in the field and collecting it on the roots of them. Then there are a bunch that are common. Um, many of these are early, Tolmantella. <coughs> many are late, um, that is more mature trees. And we would only see one of this, one Rushla, one Cortinarius. Um, so uh, there's an early, a uh, young fungus uh, clade or a group of fungi that occupy young trees and then as the trees mature they get some of these other species. So uh, we're still working on this. This is going to go a second year. Okay, so I'm getting ready to wrap this up and uh, so I, my theme was from the ashes, new life springs. And sure enough, in all of these areas, we see little, in the heavy burn areas, we see little pines regenerating. Here, we see mountain laurel and rhododendron uh, coming out from the big base um, and starting to produce new material. Also, red oak and red maple are producing new material. Um, and so, in some of these areas now, it's starting to get a lot more crowded, a lot more bushy, and the forest is gradually regenerating. And the fungi are critical early responders for all of this. 
They're the ones that have to get in and digest dead materials, the ones that have to get in and form symbiotic relationships, endophytic or mycorrhizal with the plants and let the plants get phosphates and nutrients that they need to survive. Um, so the fungi, the fifth kingdom, are absolutely critical in forest recovery after fire. So I want to thank the usual thank yous, Paul Super uh, and Christine Johnson from the park for uh, giving us the necessary permits and Christine for sending out her vegetation team to bring in the interesting fungi, really interesting. And the Discover Life in America interns and the Great Smoky Mountains Park interns who would go out with us and then afterwards we sit down and hold um, show and tell and they would all pull out their mushrooms and we'd go over each mushroom. And that turned out to be amazingly popular. The one day I tried not to do show and tell, they let me know, no, we're going to do it. <laughs> so um, I conclude my talk and I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, mountain laurel, rhododendron, oak, red maple, uh, your saying they served some root yes. survived. Was yeah. that varied between the high intensity and the low intensity? Uh, in, in the high intensity, it's really obvious that some of the rhododendrons, some of the mountain laurel are producing new shoots from deep rooted bases. In the light burn areas, uh, they're they, they were fine anyway. Um, one of the plants that survived very well, unfortunately, was what we call greenbrier or catbrier. Yeah. You know, it's got this great big tuber underneath, and that tuber did just fine oh, no. in the fire, thank you. And so there's... It's very intensity. It did, yeah. And, and so there's catbrier everywhere. Well, Too bad. Yeah. And the other one was stinging nettle, which I discovered in a hurry. What, what's the Park Service and the Forest, forest Service like learn or what they learn from your research? What will they learn? Um, they, they learn about the importance of mycorrhiza. Fungi are not, when people study forests and study fires, they don't even think about fungi. Mm -hmm. I am teaching a class on um, Mixed severity wild, the ecology of mixed severity wildfires, and I have the book on that topic, and there isn't one mention of fungi in that book, not one. So people just don't think about fungi as being really important to forest health, and yet I think that they are critically important, perhaps maybe more important than just about anything else. So would your would your work be uh, become a part of? the analysis of a control burn, whether you ought to do it or not? Um, probably uh, they will consider that. Uh, certainly they should in terms of intensity. I'd like to get into some of the controlled burn sites. They're doing some and really see what's going on there. And we may be able to do that. I'm sure they'll be glad to let you do it. I'm sure they will. Talking, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're always glad to get free work. <laughs> What sparked your interest in mushrooms? In mushrooms? To, to start with. Oh, it's been a long history. Part of it is my spouse, who is a mycologist. Okay. Um, I'm trained as a geneticist. I worked in the area of higher plant transformation. Uh, and then there came a time when Monsanto and other big labs were transforming plants for herbicide resistance and uh, uh, and such when they hired 20 or 30 postdocs and they you know they just took the field right out from underneath us we couldn't get funding they were just progressing far faster than an individual lab could so I looked around for something to do and got into the molecular end of um, fungi because my spouse uh, Ron Peterson is a mycologist and he did the morphology. So we started teaming up and working together and we've been doing that when since the mid 80s. When, when did you do that? Uh, I started working uh, with fungi in the mid, uh, about 1984. 84. Yeah, and I've been working ever since. <laughs> could, could you have done uh, then what you, what you could do now 
No, no way. No, the tech, the techniques are so improved. Yeah, it's it's hugely different now. Uh huh. Uh, here are morels uh, prospering after burns. They're delicious. Uh, did people ever burn an area to get morels? Uh, <laughs> I don't have any personal knowledge that somebody burned an area to get morels. I've, Do I've you? Had, I've had calls uh -huh. from morel hunters that wanted a map. Recently sure, areas. sure. Yeah, I think they take advantage of burned areas, but if they burned an area deliberately, I would be unhappy, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Just to get the morels. And they don't last that long. You know, you get a year or two's crop, and that's it, and then you've got 100 years till the forest regenerates. Yeah. Um, do you have much research on the effects of burns on mycelium and like large growths of it and if it, like a certain section of it would get burned, like how fast it returns to its original area and stuff like that? Uh, you could do that, I think. Uh, I don't do it, but I think you could do it by looking at um, uh, creating an artificial burn, maybe in a pot or something like that. Tom Bruns does some study by collecting soils and, and then inoculating them with, with fungi and then heating them to certain degrees to see what happens to the fungi. That's what's really pretty provocative about your work. You should study the, the research in, in biological response to prescribed burning. We, we do that regularly. Uh huh. But what's really fascinating, and I do appreciate you know, what you and Jennifer and everybody are doing, because that's the intensity and the, 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 the propagule capacity to survive mm -hmm. is, is really been, you know, that's, that's what's worked so enlightening about what you're doing. Yeah. And, and then finding the new species is, is pretty That's always fun. Pretty cool too. <laughs> right. That's always fun. Yeah. That's our eureka yeah. moment. <laughs> but that's pretty common. Well, do you go around after these prescribed burns and check those? I haven't yet. I have to talk to the park and find out when they're going to burn again. Somebody was burning on Tuesday. <laughs> really? Yeah. In the park? Pretty big. Yeah. Well, Usually the park burns are not severe. Uh, deliberately so, you know, they just can't afford to let a, a fire get out of control. And that's that's very very old literature. I mean, I don't mean to dominate the, the, the discussion, but I've been burning for 35 years, uh -huh. so so it, it's pretty common, and it's amazing how little the impact is. And for some of these plants, you're actually rejuvenating things, yeah. and and that's what's been so enlightening as well is if you're involved in endangered species, which mm -hmm. you got involved with, with the, the, the tape of my pine, mm -hmm. is when we say we're gonna burn, the Endangered Species Act actually discourages you from harming an individual. <laughs> and that gets us over into the animal bias. Right. right. That, uh, certain plants actually have to have the top killed off in order for the that's right. And reproduce. So, that's right. So that's what's really uh, very exciting about it. Mm -hmm. so, Thank you. All, all all this is, is the lie to the, the, the old thing about you know the forest fires are bad. But you you find out that hey it's been going on for hundreds of thousands right. of years and it was supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be that that's way. The way. It works. <laughs> right. But the, mm -hmm. but we've got a problem now in that the urban wildlands interface is increasing. And you cannot let a high intensity fire get out of control in an urban wildlands interface. You just can't do it. This is a personal observation. When I was young, I hunted. I don't know why I did that now, but I enjoyed it. And it was down in Alabama, and, and there's lots of pine forests there, mm -hmm. around creeks, a few part of which. But I noticed in in my hunting trips, that when and, and when a burn started, nobody ever bothered to put it out. They just let it go until it ran out of fuel. Huh? And nobody they didn't have any money to put it out. Yeah. But it, the next year, everything about the area that I that was burned changed and looked brand new. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, it now, does. Now I recognize what was going on. Yeah. 
Um, next week we're going up to look at the mosses and in the burn areas because in the heavy burn areas now there's a carpet of grass green everywhere, mostly Funaria hygrometrica, if I can throw a scientific name out. But our, our moss specialist is, is going to go up next week and take a look mm -hmm. at, at all of the species that come into the burn area and hold the soil. They're critical. Maybe the first invaders after sort fungi. Like fertilization because we had a slight burn on some of our past year and the following spring had more wild strawberries blooming than you could see. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the carbon is um, adds nutrient value. Phosphate. Carbon, phosphates, everything. Yeah, that's true. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.